Um, thank you ever so much for the invitation. Uh, I have been wanting to talk to you, wishing to talk to you and waiting to talk to you. I should rather say not talk to you, not talk at you, but should be talk with you. Rather, thank you Lavanya and thank you Dr. Lavanya and uh, Dr. Madangi and of course my fraternal greetings to every one of you and uh, the head, head of the department of English. Uh, so, and thank you ever so much. I was waiting for this kind of a meeting with the students because it's so heartening to meet students even if it happens to be online. Only a teacher can understand what it means to meet these students. And the topic is very, very close to my heart. Uh, it's on translation and of course uh, comparative literature. So, I started with a vanakkam. Uh, because uh, vanakkam is appropriate for all seasons. Uh, it's unlike good morning or good afternoon or good evening, which uh, these greetings confine themselves to a particular season of the day. You have vanakkam, which is uh, for all seasons, for all ages, and in any part of the globe, you will find vanakkam to be very, very relevant. And uh, coming back to the topic translation, I rather feel translation is uh, a senior to languages. When I say a senior, translation is born out of the compulsion to communicate. It may be a just born baby or it may be a flower, it may be a bee, it may be anything, anything alive would like to tell that it is alive and demands attention and translation is born out of that. Language, you don't need language at all for translation because you translate the body language of a person, you translate the silence of a person, you translate uh, the uh, noise you hear, even, even if there is no noise, even that gets translated. So, translation happens to be the basic uh, survival instinct. But when we are talking about translation, we come to the academic arena. So, uh, I need the children, that is the students who are over there, to have your scribbling pad ready because I am after all a teacher and insist on being one. I don't compromise with any other uh, any other title. So I just would appreciate if you have a scribbling pad with you and note down certain questions because towards the end of the lecture we'll see whether we have got an answer for these questions, right? So the first one is uh, the natural first question happens to be uh, what is translation? Then why is translation and how is translation? What are the varieties? in translation. Is translation an art? Is it a science? And why do we need translation? Jot down all these questions, we will see whether we could answer all these. So, when you take it from an academic point of view, right? translation has got uh, specific definitions given by people who were theorists on one hand and of course, literary writers on the other hand. But before I move into this, I started with a statement saying that translation does not even need language. In 1937, Pablo Picasso had a chance to paint a more than life-size uh, painting, a mural, which is uh, even now, it speaks volumes about his mastery over uh, communication. It may be through cubism or it may be through surrealism, what, whatever may be the tone in which he painted. You know, this particular painting called Garnica, you are welcome to go and search for that, right? Garnica, when he painted it, people who came to see that, especially the soldiers who entered the workshop, his studio, when they had a glimpse of it, they asked him, did you do this? And his answer was, no, you did this. Now, what exactly is that painting? Gornica happens to be a little Spanish town and that particular painting which is of, uh, he did not use any color at all, black, white and grey happened to be, they happen to be the colors he had that so that it will intensify the drama of the whole uh, picture. You had bull head, you had horses, uh, women, little dead, the body of little child, a dead little child. And of course, certain other things which made that particular painting extremely disturbing, uh, extremely violent in what it wanted to communicate. It was a kind of a strong objection of Picasso against the warfare, the Nazi Germany, the invasion, the trial bombing that happened in Garnica, the place. 
it completely ruined the lives of uh, harmless innocent civilians so as a protest he painted a beautiful picture called garnica and when people as i told you when the soldiers entered and asked did you do this his answer was no you did it so we are get back to translation this is exactly why i told you translation does not even need language because you are compelled to communicate something you are compelled to communicate your your philosophy your ideology your belief your faith your doubt and as a result of which you choose some mode of communication it can be painting it can be uh, a, a verbal mode it can be a visual mode it can even be silence but through that you very strongly communicate to your target audience what you intend communicating now coming back to as i told you the various interpretations of translation or the various theories which are propounded by theorists but if you want to become a translator in future first thing you have to remember is theoretical foundation is imperative it's mandatory it's not recommendatory it's mandatory you have to have theoretical foundation even to say no to something you have to have something there even to say that atom is divisible you have to have a theory which said that atom is indivisible so you have to have something concrete over there to accept or to negate on one hand you have the theorists on the other hand you have the creative writers who talk about translation but why of translation when you ask this particular question translation happens only when two things demand one happens to be the political scenario demands translation the other one happens to be the non secular scenario or the religious scenario so for two reasons translation came into being and uh, i would rather appreciate if you can uh, think about the curse of babel right which uh, of course the phrase is uh, used by shelley uh, when he says translation is possible thanks a lot to the curse of babel or else we would not have had languages we would have just had language so when you take this into consideration on one hand you have translators who brought translation into being because they wanted to propagate a particular religious idea on the other hand you have politics and you find kings and emperors insisted on their their faith their philosophy their codes to be translated into the language of their citizens so these two happen to have brought about this need for translation so you have lots of theories the whole lot of theories propounded by theories so we you have eugene nider you have catford you have peter newmark i just make a mention of these names because these materials are available they should be available even in your library all you have to do is go and search for them so you have nider who talks about translation to be a kind of transference of meaning and style i i just would like to make a note of those specific torch words now they give us an idea of what exactly is translation according to people who translated for a very very specific purpose specific books i call them non secular literature so nida called it a transference of of course you have to have the meaning and you have to have the style also when you come to catford he does not just talk about transference now he he says it's a kind of almost a kind of rewriting of the text from the source language the language in which the original was created and taking it to the target language the language which where you have your reading audience ready to receive your version he uses the word version okay then you have another uh, person catherine barnwell again a bible translator she goes on to say she calls it retelling as naturally as possible now these words are very important but remember these are after all all these theories are sign boards and sign boards give you a sense of direction and they do not go with you when you travel now this is again very important all these theories give you a sense of direction there after all an arrow mark to give you uh, to show you this exact this is exactly the place where you have to go but they do not travel along with you right take them only that far it's almost uh, like uh, the tools which you use 
in the process of an experiment. The tools are very important, but the process is equally important and we are more worried concerned about the produce. Right. Then Catherine Barnwell, as I was telling you, Catherine Barnwell, she talks about retelling. There is whatever has been said in the source language, taking it to the target language or the receptor language as Catford would put it, taking it to the receptor language and the process should be as natural as possible so that whatever is the impact had by the source language audience should be in some way similar to the expected impact on the target language audience or the receptor language audience. And Peter Newmark also goes on to talk about translation that is transference of the source language text to the target language. Now the problem really comes with the word text or the textual material that is exactly what you have to note down. What do I mean by textual material? What is a text? Because when you move down the 20th century you understand a text cannot just be called a text because you have a pretext, you have a subtext, you have a context, you have a post text, you have a text within the text, text above the text and below the text by the side of a text. So text is not as easy a word uh, as we all imagine it to be. So the textual material of the given uh, source language will not be the same when it is taken to the target language. Okay. Now we move on to what could be the tool for translation. I am talking only about academic translation. I am not talking about a spontaneous kind of translation which takes place in, uh, in, the, in a political meeting or in a religious meeting where a person, the speaker speaks in one tongue and immediately it gets translated into the target language uh, by a translator who is over there. I am again confining myself to academic translation which is very very bookish which has got certain rules and the rules can also be violated provided you have a reason operating behind this violation. Okay. Now the tools for translation. I would take into consideration everything available as a tool. A good thesaurus is a tool. A good dictionary happens to be a tool. A book on the geography of uh, the source language text is a tool. The historical backdrop is a, school, uh, is a tool, the social backdrop is a tool, a cultural backdrop is a tool. All these happen to be tools for the translator's better comprehension of all the forces which brought to being the source language text. Okay. You know what could be the problem of a translator? First thing is a person is extremely passionate about the goodness of something and would like to take it and offer it to other people who have no access to it. Now that's exactly the psyche of a translator. When you come upon a beautiful poem or a beautiful article or a beautiful short story, your immediate reaction is or the response is to capture its beauty in your own tongue and carry it to people who do not have an access to read the source language text. Fine. If that is the case, there are certain pitfalls. A translator would tend to become an advocate of a, cert of a pet philosophy which he appreciated in the source language text. He would become an interpreter of something. Fine. So as a result of which his uh, perspective of what is the right kind of translation would get influenced by all these factors. He, his subjectivity to something, his objectivity to something, his indifference to something his passion about something, all these will influence a good translation. Now we used the word good translation. If you have to ask A.K. Ramanujan about what exactly is translation, he will say translation is the perfect, is the art of imperfection because you do not have a perfect translation, you only have good attempts made. So as we already know that there is no possibility of making a, a perfect translation, we just move on to good translation works. A creation, for example, if Shelley has created uh, his Ode to the West Wind, he might have, the work might have gone for some kind of an editing work done by Shelley himself, after which you freeze it at a particular point of time. But if a person starts translating this work, there are various versions of the same thing. For example, 
just give a shot you whisper a secret into the ears of a friend who is seated near you and this particular secret has to be shared throughout the class but as a secret it has to pass on from one person to another person towards the end the last person who received this message happens to get up and speak out what the message is you will be surprised to see the version of that message is something entirely different from the version of what the first person spoke to the second one if this holds true and correct and good in a given point of time imagine the plight of books which get translated down the generations down the century so this um license is always accepted so we move on from here accepting that you do not have any chance of creating a perfect translation only a good attempt is possible as ak ramanujan himself was a poet and translator when he translated the vintage classics of tamil literature the first version came in the name of interior landscape because tamil ancient tamil literature talks about the external landscape and the internal landscape also when you talk about the internal landscape it talks about the emotional be being uh, the emotional uh, standpoint of an individual and the external landscape should echo what is going on in the mind of the person for example you can take even edgar allan poe's raven where you have the speaker and whatever is going on his mind is uh, immediately echoed by the outside tempestuous climate so tamil literature believed that the internal landscape and the external landscape will have to have some kind of a relationship so that it is articulated properly through words so the first edition which was brought out by ak ramanujan as a translation of the vintage classics of tamil literature he called it interior landscape he was not satisfied with the renderings or the versions of the ancient classics so immediately he brought out another book which talked about the interior landscape and the exterior landscape it talked about the love life of people it also talked about the warfare of ancient tamils and he called it poems of love and war but in his afterward he repeatedly said that it is impossible to contain uh, the poetry of the work which i translated either i have to be very uh, loyal to uh, the source language text or i have to be very loyal to my reader for whom this book is being translated now this brings us to we move away from theories as i told you the theories happen their theories have to be learnt you have to have but maybe from a, your examination point of view but as a tool also as a tool for you to lean on when you are thoroughly confused fine but we have on the other hand writer translators and uh, like criticism theory of translation also evolves according to the demands of the age which it represents so i would like to take from not from shakespeare of course shakespeare's historical plays were 100% dependent on north's translation of plutarch's lives when we have a workshop i'll come back to it again north's translation of thomas north's translation of plutarch's lives lives of kings and queens of uh, rome and greece right have it in your mind so shakespeare was is or uh, was indebted to this this historical contribution when north translated it into english and he he gifted it to elizabeth the first but of course with a note he has got the lives of heroes and the great queens not to make the queen improve in her uh, ruling method but to educate her citizens about the grandeur and greatness of people who lived in the bygone age he he gives that as a kind of an anticipatory bail not to offend the queen as i told you you have got political reasons and on the other hand you have got your religious reasons also we start with dryden which is absolutely convenient and if you remember your social history of england and history of english literature you will understand that the age of dryden is not only called the age of dryden it's also called augustan age it's called neoclassical age it's called age of periodicals it's called age of prose also now each of these names they have got Uh, something very important to communicate when you talk about neoclassical age when you go for this particular title neoclassical age you will have to understand the unity of time space the the triple unity is something very very important 
time place right and when you talk about the augustan age it's like the rule of augustus caesar and when you talk about the age of prose even it's called the age of coffee house literature because of uh, uh, how the coffee house played a very very crucial role in the political scenario and the social scenario of the augustan age like so when you come to dryden he has his own views on translation he says there is something called a metaphrase now what do i mean by metaphrase metaphrase is turning the author word for word this literal translation you can have that name literal translation turning the author word for word which may become or invariably it becomes very silly because it does not communicate what it has to communicate right the second one he advocates paraphrase where you translate sense for sense or you call it the ciceronian type of translation cicero when he try when he translated it went for sense based translation where you do not turn the author word for word but you take the sense and try to communicate if you remember what catherine barnwell said they are retelling as naturally as possible you try to capture not only the content but also the style the manner the both the manner and the matter should be retold as naturally as possible uh, as put by catherine barnwell now that's almost what dryden says when he talks about paraphrasing something so you have metaphrase you have paraphrase and the third one he talks about is imitation so dryden says in imitation you abandon the original completely and you almost create something which bears a semblance to the original it has a similarity uh, to the original but it is not the same so he goes in for these three and advocates for paraphrase or he calls it the golden median as aristotle would put it the golden median you don't go too close to the source language test text because it may be distanced from the contemporary reader by age by time by space that is if i have to translate um chaucer fine you would have had that kind of, that book i do not know whether it is still prescribed when chaucer is prescribed you have chaucer's english on one side and it would have been brought to the modern english on the other side because the spelling and uh, the grammar everything is so totally different now so even from one language to another language uh, where you call it translation from the same language also you have to translate and this is exactly what you uh, learn in your derbyshire when you talk about the synchronic study of a language or the diachronic study of a language okay so when he talks about imitation you completely abandon uh, the author of the original and you recreate something so when when he went on to write the preface for the epistles or when he translated um, ovid he went on to say i have endeavored to make virgil speak in english if he had been living in this particular point of time had he been a poet if had, if virgil had been a poet in the augustan age he would have necessarily spoken in this english that is the english into which i have translated the original so he insisted on being a contemporary to his readers because we should remember the time in which the original was created that is no longer accessible to an ordinary reader for whom you would really translate you may be very passionate you may really want to carry on you may become an advocate of the philosophy given in the original but yet you have to be loyal to your reader because he is your immediate recipient for whom you translate the whole thing alexander pope also had the same uh, view he too said i would rather be loyal to my contemporary reader than trying to be loyal to an old master whose work time and uh, his philosophy everything is thoroughly distanced from the present dr johnson when he he also belongs to the same age right dr johnson when he wrote his uh, life of pope he also said the best thing is uh, to strike a, uh, the, the middle path or the golden mean not being too close to the original not being uh, too contemporary but to maintain 
the manner and the matter as naturally as possible fine when you move out of this augustan age we have our romantics waiting for us now that's why when i started the lecture i told you if you want to be a translator well within the quotes right you have to have a thorough knowledge of the social history of the place the literary history of the place the political history of the place because a piece of work is an offshoot of all these so when you come to your romantic age for the first time the romantics moved away from translating a uh, text they moved on to the difficulties you have in translation if you get a glimpse of coleridge's biographia literaria he talks about the difference between fancy and imagination he calls imagination to be a creative fire inside every creative writer and it is inimitable it cannot be imitated by the writer himself what the passion the fire which he feels at one point of time may not be the same when you when he feels uh, a similar uh, emotion so the intensity may be totally different even if it happens to be emotions recollected in tranquility the expression would vary because the intensity is different and imagination plays a very very crucial role and he also talks in biographia literaria he talks about the organic unity which you, you find in a poem because when you talk about uh, translating a piece of poetic work you know pretty well they are the best words put in the best order and it's extremely difficult to capture poesy i'm not talking about poetry i'm talking about poesy the inherent poetic quality uh, which uh, which will get evaporated into nothing during the process the uh, the difficult process of translation so they um, coleridge beautifully puts um, a poem the lines in a poem they have got a serpentine movement that is the meaning of the words do not stay well within the words they spill over as a result of which what has to be translated is just not the words or the meaning you have to translate even the silence that gets sandwiched between words just have a visual picture of it have a poem in your mind it any any poem and imagine why that is particular way in which it has been given the the written form fine you have a written form and in that you have spaces that fill uh, they uh, they have you have spaces between words and coleridge draws your attention to that a poem has got an organic unity as there is you find that the meaning is not contained in the words the meaning is also there in silence for example you ask me a question and i do not give you an immediate answer there is a non lexical filler you would have learnt of non lexical fillers when you were in your high secondary now what do i mean by non lexical fillers certain human speech sounds are produced so that you fill in the lacuna you fill in the gap that is even before you start talking right you have a pause and the pause is loaded with meaning you cannot have an empty pause you say pause you need a pause because through that you communicate something unfortunately translation cannot hold on this view translation cannot translate silence all these theories fail miserably when you come to talking about the untranslatability of the spaces which get sandwiched between words this is exactly what happened to ak ramanujan when he was happy with this first rendering of first translation first version of uh, the work he called interior landscape and he was very dissatisfied for the plain reason he is a poet also as dryden would put it only a poet can translate poetry nobody else should venture because they cannot understand the poetic sensitivity and the poetic sensibility right so what happens to these empty spaces you know your your teacher would have asked you to have a finger space right i am talking about the non lexical fillers human speech sounds as i told you you ask me a question and i have a pause i say mm. you ask me ma'am how are you i say mm, yeah i'm fine see so my answer started with mm, yeah my nod and uh, the non lexical filler all these communicates 
something very very strong just not the words so the romantics drew our attention to this particular aspect of untranslatability this is what they call what do you mean by text material because a text is loaded with said and unsaid it is loaded with all this and what do you translate where do you look at the whole text from and what are all the things which you lose completely the serpentine movement of the words where they throw the meaning from themselves to another one so that the organic unity of a given piece of artistic work cannot be translated that happens to be the contention of the romantics fine now we come to shelley uh, shelley was extremely extremely um derogative his comment was uh, very derogative he said after all uh, translation is a secondary activity you cannot compare it with a creative activity like uh, composing a poem and he says fine it is an activity uh, where when a poet or anybody indulges in this activity when he wants to fill in the gap between inspirations and he was uh, in his defense of poetry he talks about growing a violet putting it in a crucible and expecting it to carry the color and the fragrance of the real plant real flower he goes on to say it has to grow from its own seed and that is the curse of babel that's how i started all so that is a phrase i borrow from him the curse of babel anything the the poetry communicated by one particular creative mind cannot be lifted transported easily and taken to another language plainly because every language has got its own genius inimitable genius and we have to go in for serious compromises when we come to the victorian age uh, after shelley we of course come to matthew arnold i am i am very thankful to matthew arnold because uh, his work on translating homer he talks about the problems and that gave me the title for my first dissertation for phd on translating kurundogai uh, i i i got it from him on translating homer he goes on to again uh, say almost like dryden he says i have made homer speak in a tongue which is essentially victorian which had homer been Uh, when if if he had been alive during this particular point of time had composed poems or an epic fine he would have spoken in the tongue in which i have translated him right so now we have the problem i just gave you these three people we have the romantics who talk about the untranslatability of imagination they talk about the silence which is between which swells and shrinks according to the meaning of the poem it's just not the word what is unsaid is also something that uh, carries immense meaning we have dryden who wants you to strike the augustans want you to strike a compromise between the extreme stance of being too literal or metaphrase or uh, abandoning the original and going on to imitation fine now you when you have a poet if the poet is also the translator as you have your dryden fine even uh, in in india you have girish karnad who translated his own a uh, place you have uh, tagore who translated his geetanjali from bangla to um, english they enjoy a license uh, which they alone can enjoy who an ordinary translator cannot even imagine using that kind of an allowance at all right we come back to what could be the problem what are all the problems you have the first thing is to take the space time and milieu uh, in to an entirely different area you know when you try translating classics this is exactly the problem you always have resurrecting you no know, this is uh, exactly the word which is being used uh, by if i have to it's susan basnet and andre lefevier when they talk about culture only these two people as uh, theorists brought in culture to be something very important because if you want to be a translator you have to be just not bilingual you should also be bicultural you have to know the impact of the uh, the impact the source language text had on the uh, source language soil and what impact it would have on the receptor language culture plays a very important role when you talk about untranslatability we focus only on that what really happens 
See, a pizza remains a pizza. A burger remains a burger. A rendezvous is rendezvous, right? So when you have borrowed words from another language in your, when you transport them to your target language, most sensible thing to overcome untranslatability is to hold on to them as loan words. Now, I would appreciate if you can go back to a copy of Waiting for the Mahatma by R.K. Narayan, where he has provided with an extent the whole the reading audience with an extensive glossary. So, as a translator, the first problem you have is if the source language is thoroughly different from the target language or the receptor language, fine, like Tamil and English. One happens to be a left branching language, the other one happens to be a right branching language, as a result of which they happen to be mirror images of each other. So, you have to take into consideration just not the matter, just not the manner, but also many things which are hidden under these two names. So, loan words help us immensely. I am just talking about the tools. Loan words help us immensely. Retaining the word as it is, if you are talking about idli and sambar, we have, which have already gone into the English dictionary, uh, I used to jokingly say that maybe after 20 years, if you take idli and sambar as breakfast, it, you would rather call it a British breakfast because an Englishman has always got this habit of domesticating the loan words. Once the word finds a place in the dictionary, then it becomes an English word and you cannot have your claims. As a Indian contribution to English vocabulary is something very rich, including a prepon. There is no such word. Maybe you only the teachers of English will frown the moment you say that you will insist that you advance the examination. The exams have been advanced. They are not preponed. But don't worry, we have been using that word um, so so very strongly that it has already found its place in the dictionary. So what happens? Retaining the loan words as such, calling amma as amma, appa as appa, chitapa as chitapa, chiti as chiti, and not as uncle and aunt, which are blanket terms, that helps you to transport the meaning and the matter and the manner convincingly to another language. Right. What are the methods in which you can do? See, Shakespeare's plays were taken to an ordinary person by Charles Lamb. He also translated them as tales of Shakespeare. Now, why should this be there? For example, Shakespeare has written it in English. It is understandable. You have a paraphrased edition also. But why should somebody go on to change the literary form and the narrative method? Why? Charles Lamb wanted Shakespeare to be familiar with the people, the audience to accept Shakespeare and Charles Lamb who belonged to the Romantic age had to transport Shakespeare from the Elizabethan age to his age so that he will be very contemporary to his reader. And this kind of work is also called translation. This brings us to the variety you have in translation. Paraphrasing is translation adaptation is translation. For children uh, of literature, you should understand that translation is certainly not something that was invented by the European world or the Western world. Tolkapian of Tamil also has spoken extensively of translation. Now, he talks about and uh, uh, Pavanandi Munivar of Nanul, he talks about the Varinul, the Mudalnul, the Sarbunul. So, translation has been everywhere. As I told you, either the political scenario demands translation or the religious scenario demands translation. Now, coming back to our adaptation. We have, uh, when you talk about adaptation, retold stories fall into this category, adaptation, anything that is retold. I can give you an example. That is, you go in for Ulysses by Tennyson. The Ulysses created by Tennyson is certainly not Odysseus. Tennyson's Ulysses is essentially Victorian, very much like Bharatiya's Panjali in his Panjali Sabadam. Tennyson's Ulysses is filled with the Victorian spirit, right? 
as you have the draupadi or the panjali of bharatiya's panjali sabadam of 20th century influenced by the need of the a these two one is created for the social uh, in the social context or the other one is for the political context so these two happen to be adaptations and the ramayana and mahabharata whatever you find in tamil they happen to be adaptations and this draws us to one thing i was talking to you about north's translation of uh, plutarch's lives now imagine this to be the raw material that's why i asked you to move away from the theorists come to the creative writers because each one uses the raw material to suit the needs and the taste of their contemporary reader for example shakespeare drew from the history of uh, the lives translated by north he could have his antony and cleopatra he could have uh, his uh, julius caesar the cleopatra of shakespearean age is essentially elizabethan she has nothing to do with the historical cleopatra she has no resemblance at all to the egyptian cleopatra this cleopatra created by shakespeare is so charming so beautiful it's not only antony who gets enchanted by her appearance even inobabus the most logical person with the sound reason he also makes a comment about her appearance fine so the shakespearean cleopatra is essentially elizabethan because shakespeare had one important prime obligation towards his viewing audience we take the same raw material and bring it to dryden's all for love a students who are yet to come upon these please familiarize yourself all for love again uses the same raw material but the thrust is certainly not on uh, the elizabethan cleopatra the thrust is more on the three unities advocated by the neo classical age it's a well constructed play and you find that dryden's all for love is at present more popular than shakespeare's antony and cleopatra right when you come to the next person uh, bernard shaw you will understand bernard shaw also made use of the same raw material that is north's translation of plutarch's lives and took julius caesar and cleopatra from there and created his caesar and cleopatra who are totally different because his intention was not to project the weaknesses of an individual who happens to be an emperor as you find in julius caesar of uh, shakespeare he wanted to project the strength of individuals who are caesars by nature so his objective was something totally different so his objective was 100% political and you find uh, the cleopatra and caesar of uh, bernard shaw they have no resemblance to the ones created by shakespeare right so have this in mind this is adaptation the same raw material is used but each one uses a raw material to satisfy their immediate reading or viewing audience because they have an obligation as a translator or a creator towards the uh, people right now coming to when you talk about kamban when he made use of ramayana as it was originally created by valmiki he domesticates the text these are all words which you have to understand when you come to adaptation what do you mean by alienating a text what do you mean by domesticating a text when do i domesticate a text when the source language culture is entirely different from the target language culture or the receptor language culture the translator has got uh, a moral responsibility towards domesticating a text when when do i what do i mean by domesticating a text if the text is too wild if i can use a term i may have to tailor i may have to tinker i may have to prune i may have to make it suitable for the reading audience who belong to an entirely different culture so when you talk about sita being taken away by ravana in a particular way uh, in uh, the uh, in ramayana written by valmiki 
you have something totally different in the Tamil version given by Kamban and that's why exactly you call it Valmiki Ramayana, you call it Kamba Ramayana because each of the writer has got his own reasons behind changing the text to suit the culture of a particular audience. Here she is not taken away physically, she is rather uprooted of that is the whole hut in which she happens to be dwelling even that gets uprooted by Ravana because Kamban felt that the Tamil culture would not allow a married woman to be dragged to streets or taken away physically by an, another person who is totally a stranger. So you find how these uh, that is the translators or the trans creators because it is not translation it becomes trans creation that is why you call it adaptation or a sarbunol. These people have got an obligation towards their own reading audience. Fine. Now to understand this in depth to get a three dimensional uh, perspective of the process of translation. You will, you will know that it is not just the length, it is not just the breadth, it is the depth also that matters and the depth comes out of your comprehension or your complete understanding of the culture from where you take a text and to the place the text is being taken to. Fine. Now when you talk about adaptation, once again as I told you a paraphrased edition is an, uh, an adaptation, retold editions are adaptation, abridgment is adaptation, your prissy writing is also a kind of an adaptation because from the original you bring it to one third, chopping away the dead wood, taking only the essential, knowing fully well that you have no business to distort the image. Now this is yet another problem because we have got various ways of translation. Sometimes we may take an individual idea that is uh, your style may be highly individualistic and you will uh, give more of significance, more of importance only to those areas which please you in some way and abandon the rest as a result of which uh, you have shifts. You may have a shift in the literary form that is from the form of drama to the form of prose that is you had um, um, Charles Lamb's version of Shakespeare. So that happens to be a constitutive shift from the form of the original you just make it into something which is more readable. As Dryden says or even Johnson, Dr. Johnson says the only purpose of any text is to be read. Whatever translation you create it has to be read and make it readable and the omissions and additions are commissioned provided they have a reason behind it. I can quote um, uh, Dr. Johnson, you can omit something, you can add something provided you have some kind of a logic behind. So your prissy writing, coming back to your prissy writing, you are given a training in um, going in for one third of whatever is given to you so that you understand what is very important and chop away the deadwood. I do not call it translation, I call it an adaptation. All these fall into the category of adapted text. right? So when we come to the next point, from one medium to another medium, I am not talking about one form to another form, I am talking about one medium to another medium. From the visual, from the verbal medium, if a text is taken to a visual medium, you have to have omissions and additions. I already told you each language has got its own genius and in, in the same language you do not have another word for one particular emotion and that is why I said a thesaurus will be of a great use to you if you want to be a translator. For example the word love, when you say love go in for the layers of meaning it has and when you say love you do not mean when the love between two friends, the love between uh, the husband and wife or the love between father and mother, you have parental love, right? So you have got variety in that and everything cannot be brought under the same term love. It happens in all the languages. So when from one medium to another medium something is taken, the challenges are more. This is where you have uh, lots and lots of scope for students of literature, especially students of English literature. You have um, ample scope to improve yourself and you have got even career over there. So every movie that comes over there you find it goes in for subtitling. We need people to have subtitling but when you talk about subtitling that is from taking from one medium to another medium, when you talk about subtitling 
what really happens when you go through the subtitle an english movie is a and the english accent is something very difficult for a tamil audience to understand immediately you go in for subtitling you choose that and when you have subtitling three things happen simultaneously one is you are a viewer you view the movie and you are a listener you listen to the original conversation in a tongue which is not uh, very clear to you or you find it difficult to understand and the third one you are a reader also you are a viewer you are a listener and you are a reader also that warrants lots and lots of skills it it warrants lots and lots of training if you want to be a translator who can work with the film script given in one language taking it to another language because even when these movies go for international competition film fair competitions you will find that they insist on the uh, film script to be uh, taken into the tongue which is understood by everyone in that case you have to train yourself you will not find any punctuation mark in the subtitle have you ever you would not even have noticed because every punctuation mark will be taken as a letter and they want everything to confine itself uh, well within the frame you cannot take the same the dialogue to the next shot when the hero or the heroine or the other characters are talking something else so everything will have to come well within this and your precise writing will be of tremendous help when you go in for subtitling choosing only the sense based translation not the metaphrase but the paraphrase where you go in for sense based translation whatever is said in one lengthy long sentence in one particular language can be confined well within two or three words and you should be both proficient and efficient in both the tongues and in both the cultures so from one medium to another medium and you also have dubbing here in dubbing the problem is something totally different because there has to be lip sync uh, the that is the original movie may be talking in a tongue which is least understood by the viewing audience and you go in for dubbing and the characters they may have the their uh, racial standpoint may be something totally different from the viewer standpoint but there is no problem at all if it is an action packed movie like a J jackie chan movie where you need not worry about the dialogues because he never utters any dialogue everything is through body language and uh, dubbing is very very easy i still remember uh, how the movie uh, by mr rajinikant muttu was taken to for the japanese viewing audience and how difficult it was for the japanese viewing audience to accept dubbing because they he cannot talk in that particular appearance or physical features of a person of dravidian origin or an indian origin cannot uh, that is a japanese viewing audience cannot accept him talking in japanese language and dubbing was a huge problem there and they found it extremely difficult because even uh, the songs have to be translated right we come back to certain novels that have been taken from verbal medium to visual medium and in that case i will talk about your harry potter your chronicles of narnia your lord of the ring right so when you come to that you will understand how the person jk rowling was happily present when her harry potter was taken from verbal medium to visual medium she had a say over the selection of characters she had a say over the uh, contextualization or the ambience which she wanted to prevail in hogwarts or elsewhere uh, this again draws me draws my attention to something uh, when tagadi shivashankar pillai of uh, malayalam literature when his chemin novel was uh, trans that is was taken to transcreated into a movie uh, the choice of the heroine was uh, sheela and uh, sheela happens to be uh, a beautiful fair woman but the novel talks about karuthamma and uh, i uh, i heard that tagari even exclaimed my karuthamma has become a veluthamma in the uh, movie so this happens and we have to give allowance to all because from verbal medium to visual medium is something extremely difficult now coming back to you know this takes us closer to our comparative literature comparative literature is different from comparative study without translation you cannot go anywhere near comparative literature because the passion that operates 
uh, between uh, that is in a person who wants to translate something and in a person who wants to compare the literatures of two countries or two societies uh, it's it's almost the same the same kind of passion to share to enjoy to appreciate and make people understand and accept the presence of the original day so i had a great time with my phd scholars because everyone brought in this kind of a comparison we had comparison a comparative study between bama the dalit writer and tony morrison now i i have the uh, list if i can talk about that we we had people we we had narnia and uh, on one side lewis on one side and we had another person that is the tara knots by rupa pai we talked about that on one hand we had uh, o'neil and we made a comparative study of uh, o'neil on one side and on the other side we had uh, um, our uh, girish karnad and your own ma'am uh, madangi ma'am um, has done a wonderful job of uh, comparing the works given by kalki krishnamurthy on one hand and hilary mantel on the other we had ambai compared with mahashweta devi and also the heroines of mahabharata ramayana and chilapadigaram because when you talk about epics we talk about great indian epics only as mahabharata and ramayana but in tamil we have got aimberum kapiyangal and an epic is chilapadigaram so uh, a beautiful study of these heroines and we had onil on one side and grish kannada as i told you already this is a comparative literature is between the literary produce of uh, two different countries and comparative study can be between uh, the works in a, in the same language as i told you the adaptation that is comparing shakespeare's antony and cleopatra with dryden's all for love and again moving on to caesar and cleopatra by uh, bernard shaw if you make that kind of a study it becomes comparative study and comparative literature again children of your age may can make a beautiful um, study of um, tom sawyer that is adventures of tom sawyer on hand and on the other hand you have of course um, swami and his friends by r k narayan right on one hand you have mark twain on the other hand you have uh, r k narayan and if only you can compare the psyche of these two children that is a western counterpart of uh, swami and friends you will find that there are certain things which are so similar so beautiful irrespective of the language irrespective of the time irrespective of the age there are certain human attributes which are un which have not changed at all if i can get back again to um bernard shaw in his caesar and cleopatra that's what he talks about that is people have not changed at all you may be old you may be new you may be wise you may be silly but there are certain human attributes which have not changed and that's exactly what is brought out when you go in for comparative literature or a comparative study of two literary outputs right so i really wanted to show you uh, certain books that is uh, one is uh, of course many of you may know dr kadambari of etraj college a retired professor of the department of english and she has done a beautiful job of translating a uh, dialectal text you know this is something which you have to which i have to draw your attention to a dialectal text is such a great challenge because you have to neutralize the text and then go in for translation in our workshop we have the assignment what do you mean by a dialectal text when you um bernarsh's uh, pigmalion professor higgins english is certainly di different from the english spoken by the cockney spoken by eliza doolittle but when you translate that particular work into tamil or into any language you will understand that the dialect which is spoken by eliza doolittle and which gets corrected by professor higgins both will happen both will become neutralized normalize as a result of which when you take them to tamil you do not have the dialectal uh, language spoken by eliza it will be totally lost the same holds good when you take a dialectal text from tamil nadu and get it translated that is when you have uh, translation work done by sahitya academy if the book is filled with dialectal inputs the translator will find it extremely difficult and that's what you have of uh, jody cruz who is known for Uh, writing about the lives of people 
uh, that is the fisherman community and uh, Kadambari, Dr. Kadambari has done a great work in translating. Uh, she is able to compromise or strike a balance between the original and uh, of course the English reading audience who may choose to read her book. It is Astinapuram uh, which is her work and I wanted to show you this one also. This is mine. Um, in uh, when they were introducing me, they would have uh, given you an input about uh, my work of uh, translating Kurundogai. This is a classical edition, of course, the foreword has been given by Shashi Tarur, right? And uh, this particular book is brought out by the Central Institute of Indian and Cla Indian, that is Tamil classical language. And this is a classical edition. You may wonder who is going to be its reader, who is the target audience. I'm sorry, these are all for research work alone. You will not find a popular reading audience who fancies these books. And I wanted to show you yet another one. Uh, this is the translation book of Mirdad and the original is this one. It is written by Mikhail Maimi. And it has been translated into Tamil by um, R. R. Oh God, I shouldn't forget. Uh, Puviyaras, I'm sorry, I shouldn't. He is one of the Vanambadi poets of uh, Tamil Nadu. Puviyaras, Kavinger Puviyaras, he got Sahitya Academy Award for this translation. For his own creative work, he got um, uh, Sahitya Academy Award. And for translation also, he got Sahitya Academy Award. You have to know about Sahitya Academy Award because whichever book wins Sahitya Academy gets translated into all Indian languages including English and that's exactly where the problem comes and that's exactly where you can make the problem into an opportunity because if the Department of English really starts working on this you will find uh, a fertile soil for your intellectual advancement and of course it uh, provides you with commercial benefits also. So, Mirdadin Puttagam and Book of Mirdad. I, I just wanted to show you this. And I was talking about Swami and Friends, which has been translated into Tamil, right? And this is a National Book Trust publication, the largest publication unit in the world because whatever comes. Um, whatever wins Sahitya Academy has to be translated into all the Indian languages by National Book Trust. Now, this is very beautiful in a way that when R.K. Narayan talks about Swaminathan, a little boy, right, uh, he just makes a mention that he belongs to a particular Tamil speaking community which has got its own dialect. In English, you cannot bring that dialect. You, the characters do not talk in that particular dialect because it is not available in English. But when that gets translated into Tamil, the translators have made use of the dialect which is used by the community which Swaminathan represents. And you will be surprised to know that the rendering or the translation appears more original than the original because R.K. Narayan just used English as a medium. But whatever he presented was essentially Indian. Okay, this is another book which I wanted to show you, a Sahitya Academy winning book. Uh, it's uh, translated by, of course, Kurinji Velan, Irandam Idam. Uh, it has an English translation, second turn by P. B. Rabindranath, but the book is not available. And uh, the award winning book, the original, was written in Malayalam by M. T. Vasudevan Nair. Okay. I would like to give you just how difficult it is when I, uh, an example of how difficult it is when I talk about the genius of a language. M. T. Vasudevan Nair's very brilliant work, Manya, it is missed. Anybody who hails from Kerala will understand when I uh, say Manya. The opening statement is, the author is known not only by what he says, but how he says also. The style is very important. That is why Ernest Hemingway, when you talk about Ernest Hemingway, you talk about this style. And when you talk about M.T. Vasudeva Nair, you talk about this style. The novel opens with a statement, Varum Varadirikula. So, if you know Tamil, you can understand me. Varum Varadirikula. The genius of Malayalam is, when they say Varum, they, the language does not give you any, any clue of the gender, the number, right? As a result of which you, if it can be a cat, it can be a dog, it can be an elephant, it can be a he, it can be a she, it can be they. 
it doesn't talk about whether the ob subject is singular or plural he or she nothing is stated at all varum varadirikkulla i found it extremely difficult when i used it in my workshop class in uh, uh, that is in phd college of arts and science because we found it extremely difficult a challenge for us to translate when you take it to english you may have to necessarily have a subject you have to say he will come or she will come or they will come or it will come the dieter rk that is uh, mt vasudevan nair deliberately deliberately holds on to the secret till the end of the paragraph and we the reader is uh, confused uh, to know who exactly could be the person varum varadirikulla so i cannot say avan varuvan aval varuval avargal varuvargal varamal irukkamaatargal there is nothing called varamal irukkamaatargal which is not the proper kind of construct for any tamil sentence the same holds good in english also with english also uh, i have to say he will come he will fail not varadirikulla or she will not she will fail not what happens is the suspense is not held there at all the reader gets to know who is the person about whom the writer talks on fine so uh, mt vasudevan nair's very brilliant piece about bima and unless you know the various methods of narrating something is it the first person or the second person or the third person is it a direct is it a monologue is it a soliloquy or is it an aside or is it a direct interior monologue or an interior indirect interior monologue is it a camera point of view technique which is being used by the writer you will never be in a position to translate it properly right and of course i wanted to show another book of mine that is this is again the short stories of world renowned short stories from english they have been taken to tamil most of the stories are known to you may have uh, they might have been prescribed even as your reading material for your programs and this is one thing i when i translated sirpi vasudevan i mean sirpi bala subramaniam's uh, very beautiful work poojyangal in sangili i had to understand the meaning of poojyam as absolute and not zero so this is at another work um we will move on to a workshop now uh, which also gives you a kind of chance to ask questions and interactive one am i to get the help of uh, madangi madangi uh, yes. uh, ma'am madangi madam one, just one second i'll give the catalog of the um workshop assignments mm, yes. after which we will continue with the interactive session okay, okay. so um, one thing is for workshop ask the students to have their thesaurus handy and go for meaning of words in isolation and put the same words in a context uh, like uh, he is running for presidentship what movie is running in the theater i have got a running nose the word in isolation has got an entirely different meaning i am running fever okay something is running in my mind all these have got an entirely different meaning when you put them in a particular context as i told you the other words contribute to the meaning of words in isolation then uh, you may try translating proverbs idioms and phrases fine you can have macbeth the opening scene of macbeth made of just 13 lines and the last two sentences fair is foul foul is fair hover through fog and filthy air you can ask your children to translate it into tamil or hindi right and see whether they are able to capture uh, what it tries to say because the opening scene of shakespeare it uh, tells you more than one thing Uh, the climate that may have to prevail or that would prevail throughout the play is suggested by Ferris Fowl Fowley's way how would you fill fog and filthy air i would like to tell about a student of mine in phd college of arts and science when i said when i asked my students to approve shakespeare from of course england and place him ask him to get rooted in chinniyambalayam okay uh, and ask him to speak in a language which is spoken by an ordinary person on the road Uh, one student translated it so beautifully faris foul foul is fair how to fog and filthy eh? he made it into moodu pani irittile mosavana kaathile nalladella ketta da ketta dalla nalladha 
uh, I made to come upon a better translation even by seasoned translators of this particular sentence. Okay, so Macbeth. And if the students would like to have an uh, opening scene of Macbeth to be the opening chapter of a horror fiction, most welcome. From one form to another form. Uh, ask them to make a short story into a one act play or take one act play and make it into a short story. That is also a very good academic exercise. Then the opening paragraph of Tale of Two Cities. Uh, because uh, Charles Dickens makes use of almost every possible word um, to denote time. He talks about epoch, he talks about time, he talks about age, he talks about season, he talks about every other thing and to translate that particular paragraph may be pretty challenging, uh, whatever may be the language, the receptor language to which you take it. And uh, road not taken, the very title is very challenging, road not taken. Uh, Harry Ape, O'Neill's Harry Ape uh, asks your students to take one particular passage that is a monologue which is in dialect, uh, a, a very specific dialect okay, um, spoken by the people on uh, online as ocean onliners and ask them to neutralize the text and then translate and give them a work like back translation that can be equally challenging. Thank you ever so much, you have got it there. Yeah, Harry Ape, you will find it very, very challenging. Ask them to neutralize the text or normalize the text, then translate. And when they go for back translation, they will find how they have lost O'Neill in the process of translation, or how Shelley says, poesy will be lost when you translate something. Uh, then ask them to again go in for the newspaper reports it may be hindu online also it may be hindu or indian express or whatever may be the print media everyone gets the same news but everyone caters to an entirely different reading audience their vocabulary is different uh, of course the way they punctuate even with the way they paragraph the way they give caption everything is totally different because each one has got uh, his or her own target audience a reading audience that would be a very good exercise for them and as I told you a one act play can be taken to a short story right so thank you we uh, I think you have got all those over there yes ma'am yes ma'am 